Hi, Founder fans. Jason here with Nicole Bialco, the Attic Historian. Check out her YouTube page. The link is in the description below. And today we are discussing Lord Dunmore's War. Nicole, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to talking about this. Absolutely. So Lord Dunmore's War is one of those fascinating parts of American history that happens right on the precipice of the American Revolution, but we hardly ever hear about it. So why don't we set some background? Uh, what, what are some of the causes, or I guess we should start with when does Lord Dunmore's War begin, and what are some of the reasons for it? Oh, um, that is a question that historians have been trying to answer since it happened. And I don't think that there's any consensus, which is, um, well, not a good consensus anyway, which is why I'm studying this and trying to put it in a new light. Um, I would say that the beginnings of Lord Dunmore's War really go to at least the 1760s because there's a lot of issues um, with, you know, relations with the various Indian tribes where, you know, we have different treaties. We have the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, the Treaty of Hard Labor, um, all these different treaties that have been made with different tribes, and no one seems to agree on where the boundary is. Um, so this is kind of an ongoing issue. But at the same time that, you know, the Crown's uh, people here that are trying to figure this out, at the same time, we have all these people on the frontier who want to move west, and they just, they don't want to wait for everything to be determined. Um, so you have a lot of different things going on there, and Lord Dunmore's War itself, um, as far as history is concerned, it's really only one battle, which is in the fall of 1774. It takes place six months before the battles of Lexington and Concord. So we can say that it's just, oh, fall 1774. But just like the American Revolution, it doesn't start when the first battle starts. This is a whole background that goes way far back. And a lot of times, if you can get historians to even study this at all, they focus on a very limited amount of information. Um, I'm reading one book by a historian. He's a military historian. And you, you can tell from the way he's writing, he's thinking more of like the battle and the movement of supplies. Um, I, know, I read another article recently, it was written in I think 1966. And this one's talking more about um, just kind of those treaties with the tribes and kind of the ongoing drama there. And it seems like there isn't really an overlap. Um, nobody has kind of taken all of this and made it one cohesive narrative. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out why. Well, <laughs> for context, as you said, it's a few months before Lexington and Concord, but this one battle in October of 1774 is happening as the first Continental Congress is meeting in Philadelphia. And the, yep. the, the land in question is considered Virginia, but it's parts of what we now would know, correct me if I'm wrong, but of like mostly West Virginia, but parts of Kentucky, um, uh, Western Pennsylvania, even into Ohio. So not yes. terribly far away from the First Continental Congress. Um, yeah, and it's amazing how people seem to think that all these events occur just in a vacuum and, and don't impact one another. Um, and, and that's absolutely right. At the time that Lord Dunmore left Williamsburg, to go take part in these events, he would have known good and well that Virginia had sent representatives to the First Continental Congress. So any historian that wants to sit here and say, oh, you know, these have nothing to do with each other and Dunmore's actions have nothing to do with, you know, the revolution that, that's on the horizon here, um, I'm kind of wondering what they're drinking because it just, it doesn't make any sense at all. No, so, uh, it doesn't seem to, but one of the, I like to call it one of the unspoken reasons for the Revolutionary War because it's not directly listed in the Declaration of Independence, but uh, the these Western lands that many people fought in the French and Indian War for access to, then the king comes out and has the proclamation of 1762 uh, or three. I always mess up the year on that one. 1763? 1763, yes. Yeah. Right, where he says, hey, sorry, you fought this war, but you can't go get that land, and you got not just George Washington, but dozens of very wealthy, usually Virginians, who have started corporations just for this purpose. And uh, I'm sure you're excited to get to, they send us several people, including a young Daniel Boone, out to cut his way for the Virginians. 
Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit torn when we talk about, you know, like Daniel Boone going west and we talk about Washington. Um, and I know uh, Preston, I want to say his first name is William. I'd have to those are those are the details that I always have to consult my notes on. There's a lot of people trying to move west, um, but I feel like there was a lot more at play than just that. And a lot of time, you know, I was trying to find some really good maps when doing this research, um, just so I have that visual in my head when I'm trying to kind of organize my thoughts. And a lot of the maps showing the boundary line of that proclamation. I don't know where these people are from that draw it because, you know, I'm from Southwest Virginia. So to me, you're drawing this line straight from where, you know, I'm from. And I'm like, okay, nope, nope, that's not quite right. Um, <laughs> I, I know good and well that that line wasn't there. It was actually, you know, a little bit westward. So, you know, we talk about the area west of the Appalachians is for the Indians. Okay, well, where in the Appalachians? The Appalachians is a very broad area. Um, and I think that's kind of part of the problem, too. You know, I talked about how the treaties, they all had these different boundary lines. Um, and I think everyone kind of envisions even the proclamation as being something slightly different, including Lord Dunmore, because Dunmore is granting lands that the proclamation may or may not even allow him to grant. And, you know, that's a whole other, that's a whole other issue right there. You know, if if he can't be granting the land, but he grants the land, and then it makes everyone else be like, hey, what's going on? What's his motivation for doing that? What, if he if he knew he wasn't allowed, and he gives one man this property, he's going to know that there's some fallout from that that's going to come up. So um, th that's, if you can't tell, that that's part of what I find interesting here, and then I'm trying to explore is figuring out what was his motivation, because he seems to be a man that really kind of has plots within plots, but everyone just ignores that fact. So that, that's kind of part of what I'm trying to figure out. And it's it's like a bunch of puzzle pieces that are all the same color and you're trying to figure out where they fit. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm probably speculating a little bit here, but perhaps he was trying to pacify these gentlemen going up to Philadelphia for the first Continental Congress who were so unhappy. <sighs> I mean, that's total speculation, but it just came to mind as we were talking. Um, and, you know, it's possible, I think, in a lot of ways, he wanted to be involved in what was going on on the frontier so that he could kind of control events. Um, you know, not that he was expecting one outcome or the other, but he felt like if he's in the middle of it, that he is going to have some measure of control that he's not going to have if he stays, you know, behind and lets the, the men on the frontier handle it. Um, so I think I think that's part of it. Not so much wanting a particular outcome as much as wanting to be involved. Uh, for a little while, he was able to look really good to the Virginians, making it look like he was standing up for their rights. So that helps him in a way. Um, but also we have, you know, after the Battle of Point Pleasant, Dunmore doesn't allow any of the men from the frontier to be in the room for the negotiations for the treaty with the Shawnee. He takes care of this himself, um, which I think puts him in a really interesting position to be able to control events and control relations with these tribes just in case war does break out. Um, it, did, did he start the war? I wouldn't necessarily say that. Um, like I said, it goes back to the, the 1760s. There's been something brewing for a while, but I think he did see that. He saw that coming and he was like, okay, how can I take this and use it to my advantage? So that, that's what I'm getting from him. Very interesting. So you brought up the Shawnee, and my understanding is that uh, the war was fought between the colonists and a loose confederacy of Native American tribes, but the Shawnee were the primary uh, nation leading the opposition, if you will. Yes, the Shawnee are the majority. Um, there seems to be a slightly different listing depending on what historian you read. Um, there were Mingo present, which are basically their they're connected to the Seneca um, and Chief Logan, who comes up a lot in the history of Lord Dunmore's War. He's a Mingo. He had always been a friend of the white colonists. Um, so it's a shame that it's his family that ends up getting targeted in some of these attacks. And then we also have some of the Delaware, um, which obviously the Ohio River Valley is not their initial home. 
but as the colonists had moved westward, they had to as well. Um, but yes, the, the, the main ringleaders, I guess you could say, is the Shawnee. And they tried to reach out to you know the Cherokee, to the Iroquois, to get more support. But because of the actions of the British Indian agents, basically, that had been managing affairs, they were able to limit it. So it was really only the Shawnee that ends up going to war with the Virginians. Right, which I understand took them a little bit by surprise. They, um, the, the Shawnee kind of expected some more of the Native Americans to uh, join in, especially because they had so recently fought the British as part of the Team France in the French and Indian War. <laughs> um, they had definitely sent out messengers, and it. I, I'm sure they were a little surprised that the British had managed to kind of cut off all of those options. Um, like I said, the Indian agents had sent messengers to the Iroquois and messages like to different tribes to kind of warn them, basically, don't get involved in this. Um, I think the Shawnee probably were hopeful that they would get more support. But really, um, I, I don't think it's, I don't think the Shawnee even really planned on going into this war the way it happened. Uh, because even in, you know, 1772 and 1773, even though we see these raids on the frontier, um, it's small groups. It's not all of the Shawnee. It's just a few people who had been directly impacted that are trying to, you know, make things even. Um, and it's really just right up there down to the wire before the rest of the Shawnee are like, okay, fine, we'll be involved too. So are they surprised that everyone else doesn't join in? I, I don't know, because I think in some ways it was surprising that as many of the Shawnee joined in as they did. And so you had mentioned that a lot of the, uh, the it started out mostly as small skirmishes or raids of uh, settlers' mm -hmm. camps. Um, now, I will be the first to admit, as I said before we started, that Dunmore's War Sally is not something I know probably enough about, but I do understand that uh, one of the earlier raids, I brought up Daniel Boone a little earlier, yeah. and I understand one of the earliest raids was in December of 1773, where one of his sons was part of a group West that was... Coast. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, so, I, that is one of those events that I have read about, but it doesn't fully stick in my mind because as far as I'm concerned, I think it's the main reason that particular situation gets brought up is kind of because Daniel Boone is um, such a fixture in our American history. It's something that we can kind of latch on to versus being a, a directly, a, oh, this is where it starts. Um, but yes, they were trying, his family and a few other families were trying to move westward into, you know, this contested area. And they're really not the only ones doing it because there's already a bunch of surveyors from Augusta County that are a little bit further north in what's now West Virginia. Um, so there's really a lot going on simultaneously. It's just more memorable when we talk about Daniel Boone's family because, um, like I said, that connection with, with our history and because it's families trying to move westward. It's not you know, just these random surveyors. So it feels a little more personal when you're talking about families and history. Um, I think people get a little more sympathetic, maybe. Oh, yeah, that's certainly why I brought up Daniel Moon <laughs> to be transparent, was because everyone knows who he is. <laughs> Though I also brought up December 1773 to add some context because that's when they're up in Boston throwing some tea in the harbor. So just as that yeah. happens, Daniel Boone's uh, oldest son is captured. And I, I understand, uh, again, I know it's Daniel Boone and he's a sexier name uh, to bring up. But, <laughs> you know, his son and his yeah. son's friend are both tortured and, and killed. Um, it, obviously, it's a more famous example. There's been tons of Daniel Boone shows on TV. Uh, but it is, you know, and one example of what had been happening uh, kind of across the region at this point. You're right. And I mean, it does go back to, you know, like I said, a lot of this goes back even to the 1760s. And the 1760s is when we get, you know, the Stamp Act and we get all of this other stuff that's going on and, and to try to separate it and act like the frontier is this completely different world. Um, as if nobody knows what's going on elsewhere is just insane. I mean, we have General Gage in Boston who's getting correspondence from Dunmore and from these Indian agents talking about this, you know, Indian war that's bound to happen anytime. And he's commenting on it from Boston. 
So obviously all these people are involved and they all play a role in it. Um, so I, I would, I would love to see people stop separating it. I'm not in the camp of saying that the battle of Point Pleasant was, oh, the first battle of, of the American revolution. I know I talked about that in my video that you saw. Um, I, I don't think it's fair to say that like some historians in the 1800s tried to do, but to completely separate it and act like these people don't know what's going on is just absolutely crazy because obviously they did. And there's not going to be a military leader that doesn't have this in their mind and figure out how this is going to impact things coming. Right. And if you try to argue that that's the first battle, well then I've, you know, there's several other battles that could be thrown in the mix before yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's really sticky, you yeah. know, anything like that. Um, I think people just like to think of Lexington and Concord and it's, it's an easy place to start. But again, I, um, here a few weeks ago, I was talking to my husband and he was talking about how, you know, he didn't understand why I don't enjoy military history. I'm more into the politics and like the social aspects. And he's like, well, you know, battles are where everything gets decided. And I'm like, no, no, battles are the last ditch after everything else doesn't work. There's a lot that gets decided, you know, in every other aspect of history. Um, and I think if we're going to, not you and I necessarily, but if history in general is going to sit here and debate, oh, what's the first battle of the war, we're already losing because we're ignoring everything that came before. That's the reason this broke out to begin with. That's a great point. Uh, when you, I recently for 4th of July read the grievances of the Declaration of Independence and the actual violence is pretty far down the list. So is taxation without representation, actually. Number 17 out of 27. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that was an uh, easy rallying call later on, but it's I, I, I get a little irritated when people talk about that, like, oh, that's that's the reason for the war. Not really. It was one of many. <laughs> many, was, many, exactly. many reasons. You right. don't just break out in revolution because mm -hmm. you're a little upset. <laughs> Uh, so let's yeah. talk about the war now. I, I also uh, have admitted on this channel many times that I was never into the military history very much. Uh, over the last few years, doing Founder of the Day, I've put out a concerted effort to learn as much as I can to give a full picture. Uh, that being said, um, you had mentioned that it wasn't so much of a war. It was kind of some skirmishes in one battle, essentially. But uh, I understand Dunmore does march a four. I don't want to call it an army, but a military force out from Virginia. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, the decision to do that? Oh, that, that's one of the many things we're trying to figure out. Um, okay. So there's actually, there's there's three groups that march. Um, it's three separate groups and they're supposed to meet in, you know, what's now West Virginia near, near Point Pleasant. Um, Andrew Lewis is one of the main ones. He's the county lieutenant um, and he leads I've seen differing numbers, so bear with me when I throw these out because no one seems to agree exactly. Um, but he takes about 1,000 to 1,200 men. Um, there's another one, I cannot remember his name. He, he just takes like three or 400 that, that meet up with them later, so it's, it's not as big in the story. And then Lord Dunmore is marching from Williamsburg, and he takes about 1,200 men as well. So he actually has a fairly sizable force um, compared to everything else that's going on. So he has about equal to Andrew Lewis. The problem is that he takes a completely different route. And when battle occurs, Dunmore is not there. Um, and some of what I found leads me to question on whether that was intentional or not. I'm really not sure. One way or the other, Andrew Lewis marches up through Southwest Virginia and West Virginia, um, up kind of like the New River Valley. and he encounters the Shawnee in a surprise daybreak attack. The only reason they even get a warning is because a couple men had gone out to hunt deer and they see this army and they run back to warn everyone. So it, it was very abrupt and unexpected. And I'm sorry, um, is it the, meanwhile, is it, yeah, the, go ahead. is it the Shawnee that are surprised by Lewis or is it Lewis that's surprised by the Shawnee? Lewis is surprised by the Shawnee. So oh. Lewis is still expecting to meet up with Dunmore. Um, he had gotten a messenger from Dunmore basically saying that Dunmore wants to change where they meet up. And Lewis is like, well, I don't know what you want me to do because I'm already 
I'm already so far this way. Like I can't go back and change things now. Um, and even the night before the battle, he had received, Received messengers from Dunmore, and some of the men that were involved in the battle later speculated that these messengers had to have seen the Shawnee encamped, and yet they told Andrew Lewis and his men nothing, never gave them a warning about it. Um, I can't prove that either way, but I have found some very interesting quotes in old letters where the men who were there talked about this and and their suspicions looking back. Um, so yes, it's Andrew Lewis's men where a couple of them go out looking for deer because they've had supply issues. They're running low on, you know, meat that's not bad. Um, so they went out to try to sneak some deer and they saw the, the Indians and they're like, oh God, and they run back and, and give everyone a warning. So it was, it was a surprise. Nobody's quite ready, but they're going to do the best they can because at that point, the men on the frontier um, they kind of have this mentality that if we can't settle this here, then they're going to start attacking our homes directly, even our homes that are more like along the Blue Ridge and not this far west. So they're really, even though they're not fighting in, you know, Virginia as it is now, um, and they're fighting in this disputed territory, they definitely have this mindset of we are protecting our families right now, and that is what is on the line. Yeah, and it was a very real fear. You know, it's easy for us to look back now and, you know, Unfortunately, the Native Americans found themselves largely to disease in a very sad, unfortunate situation. Um, but they, some of the nations were very friendly and some of them were not so friendly. So the idea that they could come across the mountains was not out of the question. Well, I mean, they just had the French and Indian War where they'd had the fort chain throughout Virginia um, kind of near all these people's homes. So, it, yeah, it was recent and it was real. Um, they'd had issues with the Augusta boys against Andrew Lewis. Um, the Augusta boys had wanted to fight the Indians more directly and early on. Andrew Lewis, as the county lieutenant, he is trying to kind of keep the peace and, and keep diplomacy open as long as possible. And the Augusta boys actually put out a, um, a bounty on Andrew Lewis because he challenged their uh, murder of some Cherokee that had come through the area. So... There's a lot going on, and we can't even we can't even put all of um, the colonists, you know, in one pile because there's a lot of groups within those colonists who don't agree on how to handle it. Um, and, and that's that's again where I get down these rabbit holes, and I'm trying to figure out everything, and it's just there's a lot out there. So yeah. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Now again, my research on this particular area is actually more lacking than I realized. Can you tell me who the Augusta <laughs> boys are? I have never heard of the Augusta boys. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the Augusta boys are basically a um, loose group of men from kind of like the, the Great Valley in Virginia. Um, they don't have any actual authority, but they are of the mindset that we just have to go kill all these Indians, just get rid of them, and then all of our problems will be taken care of. They're, you know, much more aggressive. Kind of, I don't know if you've ever heard historically some people would use the term you know the only good indians a dead indian these are the kind of people who thought that way um and they were prone to join together to act in an unofficial capacity and try to make things go the direction they wanted um versus all the other people on the frontier who were trying to kind of mind their own business and just create a new life for their families um so that's the kind of thing that before we get to you know Lord Dunmore's War, this is the kind of thing that Andrew Lewis had been trying to contain. Um, and when there was a band, a few years back, there had been a band of Cherokee that went through Virginia, um, and they actually had a pass from Andrew Lewis that was supposed to give them safe passage. The Augusta boys came across them and murdered them all. Uh, this put Dunmore, this put Lewis in a really bad position. They had to send messengers to the Cherokee to try to maintain the peace and reassure them that, you know, the murders would be brought to justice. Um, and then, of course, with Lewis acting in that way, they did. They put a bounty out on him, um, and then they put a bounty out on two other officials from that area who were helping him trying to keep the peace. Um, but the one on Lewis was uh, 1,000 pounds sterling, so that's not an insignificant amount at that time. Um, Especially on the frontier. Just trying to intimidate him. Yes, exactly. Um, so 
I, I don't have all the names for who made up the Augusta boys, but there was certainly enough people that had them, this mentality that it was inevitably going to cause problems. Um, up in Pennsylvania, there was, I want to say the Paxton boys, but I might have that name wrong. And basically it was another of the same group. So you hear about the ones up in Pennsylvania more often and the Augusta boys just had kind of the same mindset and they were trying to make that happen in Virginia. It's amazing. Cause usually when you hear groups of, uh, boys uh you think more like mm -hmm. frontier and wild west although obviously this was the frontier and obviously there were a lot of the yeah. same issues they would have later in the you know late 1800s further west yeah nothing new under the sun it had been an issue from the beginning and you know you get to the frontier and it's a whole lot harder to keep people in check um, when they're out kind of in the wilderness and there's not as many authorities there to control their behavior. So Andrew Lewis had his work cut out for him. Yeah. Right. And so we did kind of leave the battle quickly there. Uh, we should sum that yeah, up. I, I know that's all right. I, I have a lot of questions for you. Uh, so Andrew Lewis is surprised at Point Pleasant. Um, and mm -hmm. he, how does it go for him? So um, Andrew Lewis, like I said, they've been encamped. It's early morning, they get attacked. And there's not even an agreement as far as how many Shawnee attack them. Um, I say Shawnee, obviously we've covered, there's a few Delaware and Mingo there. Um, usually it seems to be an estimate about 800, um, maybe up to a thousand. So it may have been equal numbers. One article I read recently tried to claim that there were only 300 Shawnee, which I don't think Think that's accurate. I'm going to be doing some research trying to figure out where they got that number from. Um, I think most likely it's kind of equal numbers. And of course, if you have the element of surprise, you automatically have an advantage. Some of the men who were at this battle talked about how in the midst of the battle, um, the Indians were actually taking their dead and dumping them in the river, dumping them in bushes, trying to keep the colonists from realizing how many they were killing um, to kind of affect their morale. And there's a lot of cases um, of, of frontiersmen who just, the level of cool they maintain during this is unreal. There is one, he'd already been uh, shot once, then he got shot again um, in his stomach. And then he managed to just kind of walk off the battlefield and he was encouraging his men on the way out, you know, hey, you know, stay strong, you're good. I, I've, gotta, I've gotta go, but keep going. Um, and as he was walking, you know, off the front lines, he actually had to shove his uh, intestines back inside. They didn't think he'd survive, and he, he actually did. Um, but there's a few stories like that that I've come across where they just showed unbelievable valor, really, to be able to keep a cool and, and behave like this. But like I said, I mean, there was a lot on the line for them. Um, so they, they keep fighting, they keep fighting both sides showed a lot of valor. Um, the Shawnee were led by Cornstalk, which was a chief that had not wanted war, but once that came, he, he stepped up. And, um, you know, by the later in the day, there's already been so much death that the Shawnee do, um, do kind of surrender. But after they surrender, and Andrew Lewis, you know, sends word to Dunmore about what happened, like I said, Dunmore steps in, he takes over the negotiations. And Andrew Lewis and his men are basically told, hey, go away. I've got it from here. Um, they were not allowed to be in the negotiation. Dunmore tried to say that, you know, Andrew Lewis's presence would just be upsetting to the Indians and it would be detrimental to a agreement. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. We don't really know. Um, but I do think it's weird that, you know, no one who was part of the battle ended up having any knowledge really of you know what happened after the fact uh not that i would expect them to have authority over dunmore but you would kind of expect that they'd at least be able to be in the room and kind of know what was going on but dunmore was able to get the shawnee to agree to end the warfare they agreed to return um those they'd taken captive of, of the colonists and it ended up being fairly good terms um but like I said, it's one battle. It's not really a war, but there's definitely a lot going on in the background if we get away from the military history long enough that this is a pretty broad um, 
issue in our history where there's a lot going on and a lot that gets affected by it. Because if the Shawnee had not been subdued, for lack of a better word, then during the American Revolution, they most likely would have been attacking us from the West. And it would have been, you know, another front that we have to fight on. Right. And I'm, I'm sure with all the research you've done with the American Revolution, I mean, there, there were parts, you know, there were times in the war that we barely made it through. If we'd had, you know, another place that we're getting attacked from, we probably wouldn't have had the strength to win the war. Yeah, I, I say pretty frequently over here that the the Western theater of the war is just obscenely overlooked. You know, but not not just George Rogers Clark and his march up through the Ohio Territory, but, you know, the there's literal wars going on with the, the Cherokee and the Cree, uh, the Creek and and just dozens of nations. Plus, up in New York State, there's half of the Iroquois are now at a civil war. And fight. so, like, the, the Western the, the Western theater is a gigantic part in adding the Shawnee to that group, although. In a fashion, the Shawnee were running around saying, hey, we should fight these guys now before Dunmore's War. And then no one came. And then three yeah. years later. <laughs> well, yeah. Although, I mean, th the reason that no one came to help the Shawnee was the British. So, and, and, we, and we even see once war breaks out that Dunmore, you know, being the good guy before, now all of a sudden he has all these contacts and he's trying to call them in and he's trying to get all of those tribes attacking from the West, um, which is why I say, I don't think he necessarily had one particular outcome in mind when he marched West. He just wanted to be in the middle of it so that he could control things from there. Yeah. And you know, it kind of worked for a little bit. <laughs> it could have worked. Yeah. <laughs> it could have worked. If it weren't for that um, whole meeting I, I... in Philadelphia going on <laughs> or those angry yeah. Bostonians who just couldn't couldn't shut up and pay their taxes. Well, you know, I, I think even the influence that he had in Virginia was limited because, you know, maybe he was the one that negotiated this treaty with the Shawnee, but at the end of the day, I guarantee that the Shawnee who had been there, they knew who it was they'd actually fought against. They knew it was the colonists from the frontier, not Dunmore. So if they had to be, you know, if they had to sit here and, and debate, well, who are we willing to fight against? They're probably going to be cautious to go against the ones who actually defeated them in battle. So no matter what Dunmore tried to call in and, and arrange, they know what they were up against. Excellent. So and let me wrap, let me ask you this. I don't know a lot about Andrew Lewis. Uh, um, I'm, I know you focus on this particular time period, but do you happen to know where Andrew Lewis goes after the, the Dunmore's War, do you happen to know what side he takes in the American Revolution, I guess would be my question. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, actually, he fights in the Revolution on behalf of the Patriots. Um, his relationship with George Washington went back a long way. He had fought in the French and Indian War. If I remember correctly, I believe he was at Fort Necessity with George Washington there at the beginning of the French and Indian War. And he ends up taking a commission in the, um, in the Army under Washington, and Washington actually tried a couple times to get him a higher rank, but Congress was hesitant to allow too many Virginians um, a high rank in the army. They wanted to keep things keep things even there. But yes, he is he is involved, um, going back a long way through the Revolution, and he is very um, his loyalty lies with the frontier. I think would be how to put it. I don't know that he cared that much about what's going on in Boston and what's going on um, in other places. But for him, the frontier was his home and he did what he had to do to defend it. So, but yes, he, he was, he did not go loyalist. He was Patriot side all the way. And um, the more I learned about him, he seems to be a really interesting guy. Um, he was from Ireland. The description I've read about him, he, apparently he was this very impressive man, you know, tall, broad shoulders, um, you know, not the kind of man you want to cross, but everyone seems to have something good to say about him uh, other than the Augusta boys. <laughs> yeah, no, the Augusta boys had their own problems going on. Yeah, you know, it's funny, the name just rings so many bells. I just have trouble placing him. Like, I want to put him at the Battle of Kings Mountain, but I don't know that for a fact. But I... Uh... 
I don't want to say either way because, like I said, I, I am not a military either. I know. historian. And, um, He's one know, of those I guys, can, it's I like, cannot. I know I've come across his name. You know, I've written about like a thousand separate founders at this point. So there are like people I've written about and forgot. But like, I know I've come across the name. I just can't place it. Although it may have been studying Dunmore's War because we just really went to town on him. So I guess he yeah. would be the founder of the day today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you you could go with that. He he definitely um, put his heart in, and he spent a lot of his life devoted to the frontier. Um, his family settled in what's now like Lexington, Virginia, when they came over from Ireland, and he ended up settling in what's now, um, well, I call it Roanoke, Virginia, because that's where I'm from. I think technically it was Salem, which is on the outskirts. But to me, it was fascinating because you know I grew up there, but and I'd heard his name even. I think there's like a school named after him there, but nobody ever talked about anything he did. And then once I ended up finding out all this about him, I'm like, wow, um, kind of like War Dunmore's War overall. It's how does this stuff get overlooked for so long? Um, not that by any means that they're the only thing in history. There's tons of stuff in history that gets overlooked, but this is just what I've latched onto at the moment. Well, that's a great question, and that's something we tried to remedy today, and something over at the Attic Historian uh, YouTube channel in the description, everyone, uh, that you have been trying to remedy, among many other things you've discussed, but there's a great amount of content about Lord Dunmore's War. Uh, Nicole, thank you so much for coming to share this with us today. I truly appreciate you spending the time. Any efforts to me to talk about history sounds like a great time to me, but thank you again for inviting me here. Excellent. Founder fans, we'll be back with another founder for you tomorrow.